والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. الحمد لله. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hosai Majadidi. Um, الحمد لله I'm here, Bay Area native. Moved back about a year ago uh, to the Bay Area. I was in Southern California for almost 10 years. I'm in South Bay, but I'm so honored to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, I want to thank Brother Munir and all of the organizers of the MCC for inviting me to be here. Um, I actually did this same talk at the SRVIC, I think uh, maybe about a month and a half, maybe two months ago. Um, and it's, you know, that I was very well received, but I realized afterwards and through the course of the discussion that this is just the beginning of the conversation on this topic. We have to continuously really talk uh, about this issue. So I'm just so happy that Kamala was invited to do this here and then to have the honor of Dr. Eddie to join the conversation because of course her perspective, mashallah, is invaluable to, to hear from the mental health perspective. It's, it's just so critical. It's such a critical part of this discussion. So um, as Brother Munir mentioned, the topic for this evening is titled uh, Parenting in the Age of Social Media, Knowing the Benefits and Harms. Um, and so what my role is going to be, I'm going to be presenting well-documented research, um, anecdotal information about the dangers of social media. Um, and that's why the disclaimer is out there, because some of the content that I'm going to be presenting is, you know, again, for more mature audiences. So please be mindful. I don't want any child to hear some of the stuff that I'm going to be presenting. It might, you know, um, shock them or it might pique their curiosity in ways that we don't want. So parents, please be, be mindful of that and, um, you know, follow through with the instructions regarding babysitting. Excuse me. Now, before I get into the discussion, I actually wanted to first do a little uh, quiz. I really like audience participation, so um, I will uh, at times ask you different questions, and please feel free to just shout out answers, um, inshallah, and uh, we'll go from there. So the first uh, quiz that I wanted to sort of ask you about is your, your knowledge, or I want to find out how much you know about the history of media and technology in uh, the average American household. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out a list of different technologies that have been introduced to us over the course of history. And what I want you to do is tell me how many years you think it took for this particular, for that particular technology to reach to 50 million households in America. Okay? Are the instructions clear? Okay? So well, let's do a trial run. So the first one I'm going to ask you about is radio. How long, or how many years do you think it took for radio to enter 50 million U.S. households? How many years? 1.5. 1. 1.5? 1. 1.5, 15 years. 50, oh, 15 years. 15 years, okay, how about that? We have a brother who said 15 years, anybody else? 100 years. 100 years? Okay, for 50 million? Anybody else? Shout out some answers. How many years did it take for the radio to reach 50 million U.S. households? 50. 50. Close. 38 years. Okay? So 38 years it took. Okay. We will do a quick pause. Sure. Thank you, actually. I prefer not having to hold it. Okay. So, 38 years for the radio. The television. How many years did it take for the television to to enter the to enter 50 million U.S. households? Five years. I mean, given how you know how many there are now, yeah, that that could be. But anybody else have some guesses? I'm sorry. Fifteen. Very close. Thirteen years. So the television took 13 years from when it was first invented to get to 50 million U.S. households. The internet. How many years? Five. You can see a, there's a pattern going on here. Five, maybe? Five, very close. Four years for the internet to reach 50 million U.S. households. Social networking. <laughs> close. Actually, less than two. 16 months. Smartphone apps. One year? You guys are pretty good. Not bad. Nine months. Right? So, how long? So, Clearly this shows how fast we're moving, right? And really, th that's what this talk is about. It's about focusing on the fact that technology is becoming more and more advanced. 
and more ubiquitous, and access to information from the internet, smartphones, tablets, has reached unprecedented levels. We really have no way to measure just how much information we can access from our fingertips, but we can be certain that a lot of what's floating around freely in cyberspace is incredibly dangerous to our mental health, physical health, spiritual health, and general well-being. Um, now, just on a, as, a, as a quick side note, a respected Swiss scientist by the name of Konrad Gessner, um, he might have actually been the first to raise the alarm about the effects of information overload. In a landmark book, he described how the modern world overwhelmed people with data and that this overabundance was both confusing and harmful to the mind. The media now echo his concerns with reports on the unprecedented risks of living in an always-on digital environment. One little uh, thing worth mentioning here, Gessner never once used email and was completely ignorant about computers. Why? Not because he was a technophobe, but because he died in 1565. His warnings referred to the seemingly unmanageable flood of information unleashed by the printing press. So that's just to give you perspective about, at that time, this was his, you know, I mean, thinking of the printing press, that it's, you know, over, it's too much. So just look at what we are consuming in terms of information, right, and how much his words rang true to all of us, I'm sure we all agree, but to find out that this man, you know, lived hundreds of and hundreds of years ago, but still had that same sort of perspective is, is pretty, you know, uh, alarming, but tells you that how much further we've gone and not in the right direction. So <clears throat> every single day, there are countless news stories about students and children all across the world who have somehow been harmed by the internet because of the internet and through the internet. Whether it's cyberbullying, sexual predation, sex trafficking, child pornography, or a long and disturbing list of other possibilities. The bottom line is that the internet is no place where any child, or even adult for that, for, for that matter, is truly safe, right? This idea of safety. We just, there's just too much out there. Um, and even if you have all the safety measures in place, if you're you know, uh, using personal passwords, if you have restricted accounts, if you're using services like NetNanny or other parental control, there are still many, many risks posed, especially to children, which is what we're gonna talk about today. And uh, just to you know, give you a little bit of a story about being vulnerable online. This happened to me a couple months ago, and it's happened, um, I, I, one of my accounts got hacked and it was probably one of the worst hours of my life because I had all of my banking and other really important information saved there, and I went into a total panic. Alhamdulillah, was resolved quickly, but that was one just example of vulnerability. But recently, about a month ago, I got an email from a friend on Facebook, someone that I knew, but um, you know, not not very well, and she, uh, you know, had a link. It was a YouTube link with my face on it. It was like a video, and she, you know, she just said, "Hosai, is this you?" And I freaked out because I looked at, you know, there's a YouTube link, it's my face, I'm like, what? And it, and it shows, you know how YouTube shows like the number of views on the video? It had like over, uh, I think, 500,000 views. So I like freaked out, I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> you know, I've done videos before and I know, I think the most I've ever gotten is like 2K. Where did this, where did this video come from? 500,000. So part of me was like, you know, it, it, like intrigued, but also <laughs> scared because what if someone had, you know, misrepresented me somehow, I come to find out that yes, this what this is a you know a scam that happens to many people on Facebook, and it is a way for it to you know again exploit you to somehow um, uh, you know take over information on your computer. So alhamdulillah, I, I kind of resolved it before, but it was just one tiny example of how even someone who I consider myself pretty tech savvy in terms of trying to be ahead of things how I almost got um, you know, caught up into something like that. So just imagine, if it can happen to us as adults, most of us humble are educated, we live in the hub of you know, technology uh, for the most part, um, that we can, if we're vulnerable, what about our children? Right, so let's now just talk about uh, the dangers. Actually, before we get to that, another question I'm gonna ask you guys, how many hours a day do you think kids are spending on uh, technology in general, just throw out a number. You know, 24 hours in a day. How many hours are? And we're we're looking at kids from maybe about age 8 to 18. So in this range, five, eight, nine brothers, ten. You guys are closer. 
According to a recent study, kids age 8 to 18 spend 11 and a half hours per day using some form of technology. This includes computers, televisions, mobile phones, video games. And with many of these hours, engaging two or more technologies simultaneously. Um, again, to give you perspective, since most kids are awake for 15 to 16 hours a day, somewhere between 71 to 76 percent of their days are spent digit digitally engaged. Okay, again, just think about that. And you know, I um, I, I homeschool my kids, but I know many uh, families who use you know who are whose kids are in public schools or in other schools where technology is now a big part of the classroom right they bring in uh, computers ipads they do a lot of stuff online so factor in all of that when you consider screen time for your children because if they're getting that throughout the day and then they come home and want to play a video game or want to you know work on some apps on their phone this is where this 11 and a half hour starts to make more sense right it's like wow it's adding up but sometimes we're not thinking about all that time that they've spent on it in school. So now let's just talk about, we're gonna be frank here. Again, another quick disclaimer for anybody who's entering late into the discussion. We mentioned this at the beginning, a lot of the content that we have is not for small children or that I'm gonna be presenting. I'm gonna be sharing stories that are for mature audiences. So I please ask that you take your children uh, to the babysitting. Um, a new poll released by uh, excuse me, NetMums revealed shocking statistics on internet use by children. The survey sample was of 825 children aged 7 to 16, and also the, the survey also sampled adults, uh, close to about 1,200 adults. Again, another question for you guys. How many children from this sample group, between age 7 to 16, do you think have seen online pornography? Throw out a number. I still see some small children, parents, please. I'm sorry. A 90%, 75%, 90%, 95 okay. Alhamdulillah, those are really high numbers. Thank God it's not that high, but it's still pretty significant. 42% of children admit that they've seen online pornography between this age range, 7 to 16. Alhamdulillah, that's nearly 50% of, of the sample. Um, 1 in 16 have been exposed to hardcore pornography. And if you don't know the difference, I mean, I, I don't want to tell you that difference, but it is something that you should know as a parent. Alhamdulillah, it's just the world that we live in. We have to know these terminologies to understand the difference. Not that one is better than the other, Alhamdulillah, they're all terrible, but it's just a matter of being informed. The fact that, 16, uh, that one in 16 have seen things that are, you can't erase those images. They're, they're, they leave an imprint that is spiritually and mentally and, and many, emotionally even very, very damaging. But those are things that cannot be forgotten. One in 12 have exchanged messages with sexual content to other people, while one in 25 have sent graphic photos of themselves. And every day you will hear stories if you're you know, at all um, you know, connected or, or following different news stories. You always find stories about how some child you know, got um, their, their pictures somehow ended up being passed around in high school and you know, through social media. And, and then in many cases, they've led to uh, suicide. I mean, there's documented uh, cases of this happening right here in our world where uh, you know, by, even by accident, sometimes these things happen. But then all of that, it leads to that. So 25% of children um, get away with pretending to be older than they are. And this is something that we really have to be uh, mindful of. The fact that nowadays, all it takes for a child to access online pornography is to visit a pornographic site and to click uh, a, just a checkbox that says I'm 18 years or older. There's no further you know, th process. There's no uh, checking for identification. There's nothing else required. They've made it so easy for a reason, obviously, um, because that's what they want to do. Uh, but we have to be, again, mindful of that, that kids can be, can pretend to be much older and get access to things if we allow them the access in the first place. And that's where, as parents, we have to really look at what access do they have and am I really being observant or not. Um, almost three in 10 parents, 29% uh, let their kids use the internet without any restrictions or supervision. So if you are that parent, and I you know, was talking to Dr. Rani earlier today about this topic, and I was just mentioning one of the problems that we I think as parents, and I have two boys that are very young, but I think as you know, parents that I've spoken to who have teenagers, 
One of the problems that we get um, caught up in is the friend, you know, wanting to be the friend uh, parent or, you know, have that role in, in, our, in our children's lives where they look at us as friends. And sometimes because we're afraid of, you know, losing a connection with them or that they're going to turn away from us, we might get a little too relaxed about our rules thinking, oh no, they're gonna be angry at me, they're gonna be resentful uh, towards me, they're not gonna hate me. So it's like, okay, fine, I'll give in, I'll give you this, whatever you want, if you whine enough. And this can actually, you know, it really opens up um, so many problems because we're not thinking, we're, it's a short-sighted, uh, you know, a fix, not necessarily, but it is, because it's, it's, you know, helping, it's giving you some temporary relief of your own guilt, but then in the long term, you're opening up Pandora's box for your child and our role more important than being their friend is being their protector So the idea that you know three and ten parents are just kind of like eh, Okay, fine. You can go and you know surf the internet without me even being there or l letting um, these gadgets go inside bedrooms that can lock I mean these are things we have to be mindful of and we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit um, I do have more to present here, but just you know I want you to be comfortable if you have anything to uh, any input to offer or questions to feel free, you know, it's a, it's a conversation and I know I kind of am going But I, I want to get through the content because inshallah we also have Dr. Rani here and I definitely want to hear from her So I'm rushing a little bit, but please feel free to answer uh, ask any questions at any point um, Another question for you. What do you think is the youngest age of children whose parents allow them to go online? The youngest age like we, we talked about eight seven one, five, uh, sad. 16% um, of parents allowed children who are three years or older to go, or younger, excuse me, to go online. Three years. Because they think it's, oh, it's so cute, it's, it's innocent, oh, the, you know, he's on ABC Mouse or whatever, and it's like, okay, it's okay, I'm going to go, you know, cook, I'm going to go take a shower, you sit at the computer and you do things. But as we all know, it just takes one wrong click, right? One uh, back or one forward arrow, or one you know little ad that you shouldn't see, and it's over. All the brothers seeing things they shouldn't be seeing. According to another study, 45% of kids eight to 11 year old, eight to 11 years old, use social networking sites. Okay, uh, for the eight to 11 year olds, we found that the top four sites. Actually, does anybody know what do you think are the top sites that these kids are going to? Let's just test your knowledge. This is where you really want to see how you know, well informed you are about what kids are doing, not what adults are doing, what children are doing, because they do have different uh, you know, interests. So what do you guys think? What are the top four ads um, for this great group, eight to 11? I mean, excuse me, not ads, uh, social networking sites or websites that kids enjoy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Snapchat, we know Snapchat, that's the social media. YouTube. YouTube, okay. Very good. You've gotten one so far of the ones that are listed here. Just one. YouTube is on the list. Snapchat for this demographic is not is not on the list. Facebook. Facebook. Very good. I know it's kind of surprising because I, I I kind of associate Facebook with more of a chore like adult you know uh, platform. But apparently kids between eight and eleven also are on Facebook. So um, eight to you know Facebook, YouTube we have, and then there's two other that I had never heard about until I started doing the research for this which is called Moshi Monsters. Does anybody know this? Moshi Monsters, raise your hand if you've heard of this or your kids know this. Okay, so we have Moshi Monsters and Club Penguin. Club Penguin, you guys know. So these four are the top uh, sites for children between the ages of eight and 11. The po most popular activities that this age loves are playing games, private messaging, posting comments, and posting their own status updates. Okay, just again, to kind of look at, analyze the behavior. Like, what are they doing on these sites? They're engaging, obviously, that's what social networking is, it's, it's communicating, but there is also a, a cycle that, that you start so early, this cycle of what? What is the cycle that we're feeding when we allow children to constantly, um, you know, have this type of interaction where they get immediate feedback? You know, what is it? It's like I, I go and I post something, someone likes it, I feel validated, right? And now I've created this need where it's like I constantly need validation. It's, it's just immediate, uh, you know, instant gratification, instant satisfaction. I can see if people like what I'm doing, if whatever, you know, so, so it creates it. But at such an early age, so you want to think about how that is going to affect them as they move forward in life. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So while many of us know the inherent dangers and risks that the internet generally pose, we've talked about some of these things, um, we may be blind or may have a sort of a blind, a turn of blind eye to the seemingly benign aspects of the internet. We mentioned, um, you know, one app in particular, Snapchat. It's a colorful app. What, what's the, uh, the, um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Not icon, the, the logo. Or, you know, the, the main thing of Snapchat. What is it? Ghost. It's a friendly, cute ghost, right? So this is how they lure children and youth in. They make it really fun and yellow and bright, right? And then we have Twitter, which is like a little cute bird. Um, we have a meerkat. Um, that's another uh, app. Uh, friendly robot, right? For uh, Reddit. So there's, if you look at the kind of, you know, the intent behind some of these apps, they are appealing to younger minds. They want young impressionable minds to kind of oh you know feel some connection to it so this is you know again pay attention to this because it's all very intentional now um snap uh, snapchat i'm going to kind of go through some of these just to, again for those who don't know anything about um, these applications just so that you know why what they're used for how they're used and uh, and then we'll, we'll get into some more um uh, content here but snapchat the name of the cute little ghost is actually Ghostface Chilla, okay? That's based on Ghostface Killa of the Wu-Tang Clan. I had no idea about that. Um, and the reason why they use this ghost is because it represents the whole premise of Snapchat, which is there and then gone, right? So it's in existence and then it disappears, right? Um, and so this kind of, you know, again, reminds us or, or I think if we want to think about the digital footprint because some people think, oh, it's no big deal, you know, and, and Muslim kids are doing this. I'm just going to be very frank. Muslim kids are not, you know, uh, protect or, you know, uh, impervious to these things. They're, they're going, they, they are affected by the culture around them. So I think sometimes we get in this thing like, oh, our children will do that. Actually, they're doing it. And what I mean, especially with Snapchat, one of the things that, is, that Snapchat is known for, it's associated with, is, is sexting which is a term that, again, if you don't know it, look it up, but it's something that's very, very pr uh, common amongst teenagers, even as young as, you know, um, uh, older elementary kids are even doing this, where they're, you know, exchanging inappropriate messages with pictures. And so this idea that, oh, it's there, but then it's gone really quickly, makes people think like, oh, it's safe, but many people don't know that you can actually take screenshots on Snapchat. So is it really gone? Right, if, I, if you send something and you think, oh, it's gonna be gone in 30 seconds, not necessarily. So this is something, unfortunately, many people learn the hard way, but parents have to be kind of, again, mindful of that. Um, uh, that, that yeah, it's not as, as safe, uh, you know, as it kind of presents itself. Um, let's see. So we talked about between the ages of eight and eleven, which one, you know, that that's that demographic. But what do you think is the most popular apps according with with teenagers or with older kids? Um, what do you? We mentioned some, but go ahead and shout out some answers. There's a top ten list that I have. Instagram. Instagram. Good. We know about Instagram. It's on the list. We know about Snapchat. We mentioned it. Twitter. Twitter. Uh, actually, yeah, Twitter is on the list. Anything else? WhatsApp. WhatsApp. That's number one, by the way. So whoever said that, you know your stuff. WhatsApp is the number one app for teens, okay? According to a, a study um, on LifeWire.com in October of 2016. So it's pretty recent that this is, and things change all the time, but uh, at least for the past few months or so, this is relevant. So WhatsApp being number one, Snapchat, Instagram, Vine, Tumblr. And then these are ones that I had never heard before. And you can, if you've heard of them, raise your hand. Feed, P-H-E-E-D, you know it, anybody else know Feed? Okay, much about one person, but again, as parents or, or educators or people who have maybe nieces and nephews that are teens, we should be always ahead of the game. We should know what these things are. So, you know, knowledge, Feed, Kick, K-I-K, how many have heard of Kick? Okay, mashallah, you need to come up here, sister. <laughs> no, you know all the apps. Okay, ask.fm, again, top 10 list. Uh, Twitter, Google Plus, so these are all, you know, the things that teenagers are really um, into. And now what, what are they about? We know Snapchat, we already kind of went over that, but Feed, 
is popular because it's built to offer the best com components of all social networks while remaining heavy on the multimedia side of a photo and video sharing. So more kids have been turning to this one to connect to their friends and express themselves. So if you think, oh, well, my kid doesn't have Instagram, he doesn't have Snapchat, he, there's no real you know, medium for him to share, her, or him or her to share photos and videos, just you need to be monitoring their phones and see if maybe they're, they've caught you know, this new app that's, that's uh, popular among their demographic that parents are not really, you know, they don't really know about. Again, that's P-H-E-E-D. Then kick, why is it popular? Um, well, first, before I tell you about it, let me just ask just a general, another general question. For services like WhatsApp and iMessage to work on our phones, are phone numbers required? Yeah, yes or no? Yes. yes. So a lot of people, or a lot of parents who give their kids phones without um, numbers associated with them falsely think that there's no way that their children could be text messaging because they don't have a phone number to do, you know, to download these apps that would work. Well, that's where something like Kick comes in. Kick offers a platform for teens who do not have phone numbers to actually send text messages back and forth. Um, so again, look at your child's phone and if just because you don't see certain you know messaging apps doesn't mean that they're not doing it if they have these apps and um, in many cases these are things that you know kids are sharing with, with each other there's an entire you know um, force out there that is happily trying to teach children how to do things behind our backs. They have found every which way, and I actually remember reading a study not too long ago, there are thousands, not just like a few, thousands of apps that are actually, they hide, they mask, they're, they're masquerading apps, so basically, they look like a calculator, or they look like something totally innocent that you would never think was an app in the first place, but it's actually a portal and these are developers, web developers, that are making these by the thousands for children so that they can find backdoor channels to basically do all the stuff that parents don't want them to do. So if we as parents don't know that these things even exist, and we think, oh, my you know, child has an iPad and he just uses it or she just uses it for school and nothing else, but we don't bother to go periodically and look at the content that they have on their apps. Um, and I don't, I mean, just... We'll talk about this, but you know, if you're gonna announce it, like, oh, uh, eight o'clock after dinner, I'm checking your phone. That's not very smart because what's gonna happen? You know, that child could instantly go, oh my gosh, I gotta delete everything. So don't do that. These have to be like, you know, I'm not announcing anything. Give me your phone. You know, I'm, just, you know, just I want it. And that's where you. And we'll talk about like how to, you know, navigate those conversations because they are difficult um, to have in some cases. But the point again being that there are these apps that that are are. That's what their intent is, is to hide stuff from us, but we need to know. So this is one, kick is one, that kind of, you know, again, parents need to know about. Um, let's see here, how much time do we have before we have Like 10 minutes, right? Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I don't... Yeah? You want to stop and <laughs> Okay. Anybody have any questions about any of this so far? Oh, okay, so I'm just going to now tell you a little, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? I saw him. Yeah, so I actually control all my data. Okay. I love it. Excellent advice. And actually, please hold on to even more ideas like that because at, at the end, we're going to actually talk about um, different strategies that we can use. And I want parents, especially those with teenagers who've been down this road before and know it all, to please uh, voice what you've done and what works for your family because there are other families who just don't know where to start, where to begin, how to have these conversations. So Jazakallah khairan, I want to hopefully pick your brain um, at the end of the conversation too. Um, are there any other questions before I get into this quick story? No? I'm sorry, I thought I saw another hand. Okay, so this is just a story that happened, um, maybe, I think it was last year, um, but it stuck with me because it was just so disturbing. I uh, was on Instagram and I actually, I've, it's probably my least favorite of all social media apps um, because for those of you who don't know, first of all, how many people here have an Instagram account? 
Okay, how many of you know, or um, your kids might have an Instagram account? Okay, so Instagram kind of presents itself pretty, again, innocently in the idea that, hey, I'm just sharing pictures, and I get to control who I share it with, and so there seems to be this whole, like, you know, th there's a lot of control in it. When, in fact, if you're not familiar with how the app works, there's a page or uh, one of the features of the app that I think is probably the most just horrible thing on uh, the apps that I've seen. Why? Because it's called the Explorer page. And what the Explorer page is, it's you know the way that they have their algorithms. They basically are able to put a bunch of things on a screen. You know, you never ask to see. It's not uh, at your discretion whatsoever. It's actually content that friends of friends of friends or whoever you're connected to on your accounts might be interested in and somehow because they are watching it and they're viewing it it's now on your phone so i mean just think about that like if you're you know if you don't know someone that you know a, f a friend or maybe they're you know a, a, you know a friend of a friend that you don't know is into things that you don't want to be seeing you have no control over that it'll just come up on your explorer page so think about that if your children are on instagram because i had this scenario a few years ago where, or I'm sorry, last year, a few months ago, or a little more than a few months ago, but last year, where I was um, on Instagram and I saw this uh, picture of what, he, 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 he was like a young teenage boy, and it was, he was a model, and he came up in my feed, and I was like, wait, I don't recognize this person, like who is he? So I went to see his page, and um, you know, his, um, he, he looked, he appeared to be Muslim, so I was just like, who's this Muslim kid? Like, is he a model? I went to see, you know, the, the top, like, comments. It, this name stuck out to me, and it was a Muslim girl, and she, you know, she had a clearly Muslim name, but I, I looked at the message that she left for this model. He was probably a 16, 17 year old. He was a you know, good-looking kid, but I just was like, oh my God, Awadhu Billah. She left a very graphic message for him about what she wanted to do to him, and it was just horrible. And then I just started skimming, and I realized like she probably she had some sort of an obsession with him because she had written on almost every single message of this, I mean, on every single picture that this boy had posted. Um, and then when I clicked on her name to see if I could see her, because it just you know I, I was assuming she's got to be a young teenage Muslim girl. I, it dawned on me that this is not just a teenage girl. She was probably like 10 or 11 years old. But if you had seen the words that she was using, I mean, very vile, very just inappropriate comments. And I just couldn't believe it all over that. Because, and I, instantly I thought, this girl, it's, may Allah guide her and forgive her and protect her, but the, where are the parents? You know, if you're not aware of what your children are doing and she's not just, you know, I mean, she's posting things that other people definitely were not posting. They were just remarking on how his good looks, but she was getting very graphic. There's some problem here, but this is just one story of, I'm sure, thousands of instances where, you know, kids, when we don't provide guidelines and, you know, real clear boundaries, we give them too much leeway, and this is where, you know, shaitan has a field day, and he, this is what his intention is. He wants to destroy us at every opportunity, and the younger he can get us, you know, young, the, it's, it's even better, because it's like your whole lifetime, you have problems. I mean, I know of, of, of people who've really struggled because of things like this happening to them at young age, where they were exposed to things they were not meant to see, and it's a lifelong challenge and struggle. And I'm sure Dr. Rani and Shala can give us more perspective on how these things can really, really harm us um, in the long run. So that's just, again, one example. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Facebook, you know, it's another thing that, again, most people, like I said earlier, think, oh, it's an adult platform, kids aren't on there. It's actually not true. There was an article, I'm not sure how many of you read it, it was pretty kind of floating around Facebook and other social media a couple months ago about the mother in UK. Did you guys read that one? Her 11-year-old daughter. <clears throat> this is, again, a really horrible story. You could do a search for it. But her daughter, she was, she thought she was, again, this mom thought she had a handle on social media. She, her daughter really whined and whined and whined for a Facebook, a Facebook account. She said, okay, sure, she let her go on. And then next thing you know, this horrible, horrific thing happened to her daughter where basically she um, had all you know friends from school on her account, but someone, a uh, friend requested her 
And this person presented himself as a young boy, teenage boy, same age, you know, 11 year old kid. Um, she had 32 mutual friends with him. So she thought, you know, just someone that I know, I must know, maybe I know through school, I don't, you know, know someone who knows. She accepted his friend request and he wanted to, um, you know, talk to her online on the camera. And again, she's so young, she, she just kind of had liberty, so she, she got on camera. And it turns out, um, again, I'm sorry, there's a lot of small children here and I, I can't tell these stories if children are gonna be in the room. So uh, parents, I please ask that you, you, you protect your children from what we're sharing here. But she found out that this wasn't actually a man. He was a much older man. And he got her on webcam just so that he could basically pleasure himself um, to her. And this traumatized her. She, you know, panicked, freaked out, and then hid it from her mom. But what did he do? Let's look at, you know, what he did, which is something parents have to think about. He very methodically befriended 32 of her friends before he asked her. So sometimes if you think, you know, oh, there's all these connections that we have mutually, can't be harmful, every person must be vetted. If you're going to allow your children to have accounts, you should know every single person on their account. And if you don't know them, if they have a, a weird name or a nickname or if they have a picture of a cat, that's not good enough. You should say no. I need full transparency if you're going to have these accounts, and I need to know their, who they are, where they live, what school they go to. But to kind of have this blind, you know, um, or not really have these conversations with your children in the first place, mm -hmm. then you've said, and not to blame the mother, but just again, these things happen and we have to take lessons from them, that we have to protect our children. So we have to have these conversations with them. That just because you get a request from someone, even if you have mutual connections, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat, whatever, if you would Again, our parent who is allowing your kids to do these things. Remember this story because he took away her innocence at 11 years old to, and one of the horrible accounts or descriptions in the story that the mother shared in the article was that, oh, but it's just so tragic. She's so innocent. She, she was scared to show herself on the camera, so she was just holding up her teddy bear. So just imagine, you're holding, uh, this 11 year old poor innocent girl is thinking, oh, I'm talking to another kid my age, holding up her teddy bear, and here's this you know, human devil who's basically on the other end, ready to take away all her innocence. And you know, she's scarred for life. But again, as parents, our job is to know that these things can happen, and to be vigilant and to have these very, very open conversations with our children and to have absolute boundaries. And again, we're going to get to that, inshallah, um, in, in, in the follow-up discussion. Um, any other questions? I think we're going to stop soon. Yeah, it's like one minute left. So any questions before we stop for prayer or comments? Okay, inshallah. So I think we'll go ahead and stop for prayer and then we'll come back, inshallah, and we'll get a chance to hear from our dear Dr. Buddy. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. We're going to go ahead, inshallah, and pick up where we left off. And I promise you, I know we're all eager to hear from Dr. Rania. She keeps telling me to keep going, but I'm going to try to uh, go as fast as I can because I want to hear from her as well. And inshallah, we also want to have a discussion with you. So um, we do want you to, you know, think about questions you have or if you have any anecdotes to share. Those are really powerful. Uh, you know, stories always stick with people. So think of things that maybe you can contribute to the conversation, inshallah. Okay, um, can you? Yeah, it's good, right? I don't know why I can hear you something. Okay, I just want to make sure I don't get any static. Bismillah. So, um, again, you know, we went over quite a few different apps and talked about their purpose and, and some of the threats that we uh, you can experience on them. And we could do this for every single media, you know, social media app out there, but we just don't have the time to do that. Um, the point that we're trying to make here, though, is that we as parents, must be vigilant about these things. That's really a very big part of our role um, as believers. The Prophet ﷺ said in the sound narration, all of you are shepherds, and each of you is responsible for his or her flock. An imam is a shepherd, and he is responsible for those in his care. A man is a shepherd in respect of his family and is responsible for those in his care. The woman is a shepherd in respect of her husband's house, her children, and is responsible for those in her care. The servant is a shepherd in respect of his master's property and is responsible for what is in his care. All of you are shepherds, and each of you is responsible for his or her flock. 
Now, I personally know many people who avoid social media like the plague. They're like, you know, very proud. I'm not on Facebook. I don't know, you know, about Instagram. I don't know about Snapchat, which is perfectly fine. And much love to each your, their own. I totally respect anybody who wants to stay off these platforms because of, you know, for whatever reasons they choose. However, again, as parents, as, educated, as educators, and as shepherds responsible for our flock, it is our duty. We have to be aware of the dangers that are out there. So you don't need to create accounts to be on them and to be active, but you should know how to navigate through these platforms. You should know better than your teenagers or your children how to, the ins and outs of Snapchat. You should know them. You should know better than your teenagers the ins and outs of Facebook and Twitter or whatever apps that they are on you should know them better. Why? Because if you don't know them better, it's basically just like, you know, think of a shepherd. You know, my, that's, this hadith is one of my favorites because it's so, uh, such a perfect analogy to what we're supposed to be doing. The shepherd, where does he stand or does she stand in, with respect to her flock? Does, at the side or where else? I mean, they're, the, they're leading the flock, right? So does the shepherd go behind? Is it like, oh, I'll catch up to you? Or I don't care, I'm gonna open the gates and you run wild. The shepherd does what? Walks ahead of the flock, always, why? Why does the shepherd walk ahead of the flock? The staff that the shepherd holds, there's many functions to it. One, to corral the flock. The other also to test the ground beneath, right? A shepherd needs to know if, if his flock is gonna enter what, some really crazy mud, you know, uh, quicksand or something dangerous out there or there's traps. But the point is, is the shepherd is always ahead of the flock, ahead of the game, preparing uh, and, and looking out for imminent threats and dangers. We don't send our very innocent sh children, our beautiful beloved flock out into the wild, you know, without any care and just expect them to come home without being harmed. That's crazy. Nobody does that with your own children. You wouldn't just open the door and say, go, go explore the earth and come back when you're done. But for some reason, the internet seems like, oh, it's okay, it's not a big deal. You know, I trust them. And a much it's good to trust, and I, what I don't want anybody to do is take this information and create an environment of suspicion, because suspicion is haram in Islam. We're not leading with suspicion. We, we don't want to be these hovering, you know, sort of um, just like, you know, everybody's super spy, you know, all of a sudden, where it's like coming out in the middle of the night and, you know, just doing crazy things to try to unearth what your children are doing. That's not the culture that we want to inculcate in our families. This is about transparency. But knowledge, information is knowledge, and knowledge is power. So if you don't have the information and you don't have the knowledge with how to navigate these conversations, then what's going to happen, like so many parents, is they're going to call most likely Dr. Rania, or maybe someone like me who's kind of in between the mental health world and, you know, the, the Muslim community. And they're get, and I've had this happen to me. Phone calls, desperate phone calls for, you know, I have a situation, an emergency situation, because my child, you know, did this, or my child, you know, found this. And, and it all started with this too much leniency, you know, giving too much, uh, because, you know, for, for whatever reason. But the point is, is Again, our role as parents is we have got to get over this idea that I'm not interested in this stuff because it just doesn't appeal to me. I'm old-fashioned. You know, I like let I love handwriting handwriting my letters. Great, you know. Take out the typewriter. You know, if you want to away and send beautiful letters to your family, that's wonderful. But if you're so out of touch with the world that our children have, unfortunately, you know, this is just around them everywhere. We can't escape it. It is everywhere. And if, if you really think about the future, this is it. I mean, we're already, things are becoming obsolete. Newspapers, magazines, books. Books are becoming, unfortunately, obsolete. How many people here have, have witnessed in our lifetime the closure of bookstores, right? Isn't that heartbreaking? I mean, I remember one of the things when I came through, rolled through Fremont um, after I had moved away to Southern California, it was heartbreaking, was Borders, Barnes and Noble, like all these bookstores that I had so many amazing memories shut down because people aren't reading anymore, everything's online. Point is, digital world, kids are, this is the world they're inheriting, so you can't afford to be ignorant and don't take that in the wrong way. Ignorant in the sense that you just don't know. 
of these things. You can't afford it anymore because you're, it's, you trust me, it's happened to too many people and it's a horrible situation to be in as a parent to know that, uh oh, my son is now addicted to pornography because I didn't, I wasn't thinking when I let him take his iPad into the room and I thought he was working on his science project. Nope, you know? Or my daughter's got a boyfriend who's, you know, from X, Y, and Z country, and she wants nothing to do with Islam anymore. She now wants to be with him uh, because she was texting in the middle of the night because I didn't think to take her phone out of the room. Why, does she, why do children need this in the middle of the night? You know, we use these, we, we hear their excuses and we think like, really, there's, I mean, just think about it. If, you know, this is not the only alarm. Fudger alarm, I'm sure we've all used that excuse, right? It's my fudger alarm. And maybe kids are using that with their parents, or, or you know, I have, um, I don't know, it's in, like for whatever, you know, maybe to wake up for school or whatever, they're, they're, they're you know, using it as an excuse. But the point is, is, this is not the only thing that we can use. So we have to, again, think about these things, inshallah. Now, um, part of this, in addition to having the knowledge, is also thinking about what are the spiritual measures we're taking to protect our children in our homes. One of the things that, you know, and it's uh, something we really should think about, the world outside of us is in many ways a battle zone. It's a spiritual battle zone. And alhamdulillah, we come from a tradition, you know, this is why the, the dua is so powerful, you know, alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam, because Islam is truly a great blessing. We have du'as from you know 1,400 years ago that are more relevant now perhaps than any other time in terms of the evil around us. The Prophet ﷺ in sound hadith is reminding us that we have to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from every evil in creation. And unfortunately in our lifetime, the number of evils has just grown and it continues to grow and grow and grow because of many, and, and many, for many reasons because of these things that, have, that the internet has sort of opened up to our societies. So are we taking spiritual precautions to protect our children? For example, in many of our cultures, I see much, a lot of people here I know, some I don't know, but I can presume that a lot of our cultures are you know, from, from you know, the Indo-Pak, Afghani, Arab you know, uh, cultures. And what I know from these cultures is that we have a lot of practices to safeguard infants and you know, tiny little babies from nazar and ayn and evil. But then for some reason that sort of just starts to just stop. And we don't really think about the importance of saying du'as on our older children, you know? If you have little tiny kids, or I mean infants and children, and you're, you know, do, doing all these du'as, reading, you know, protective du'as over them, hanging, you know, rupiahs on them, or, you know, people just do all sorts of different things. I mean, I had a, I knew a friend who's, um, his mother, because mashallah, she bore very beautiful children. Even her sons looked very beautiful. They had like, you know, thick eyelashes and they looked almost like girls. They just had very, very beautiful features. She would purposely dress them as girls because they were boys, but they were just so extraordinarily beautiful for boys, I guess, that she didn't want people to look and say, wow, that's a, you know, he's a boy, oh mashallah. So she would just dress her sons up in dresses. You know, and then I know in many of the the, um, the Desi uh, or in the Desi culture, I know this is popular where people will mark you know infants with like black marks. You know, you know you, you know people who do that, right? They'll take like a kahal and they'll like put a brown little you know weird dot here or there, make it look like a hairy mole, all because it's like oh I don't want any ayin, I don't want any nazar. In addition to doing dots, but we take these steps for infants, but we don't think your teenage children they don't need protection from evil. You know, there's du'as out there. So we have to say the du'as. And, and you know, there's mashallah awrad, which are litanies. These are, these are you know, uh, prayers that are from the sunnah that we should all be implementing. The wird al-latif, the uh, al bashar. There's other du'as as well that you can get online. There's no excuse anymore. And what you just have to do is start habituating yourself and your family to making sure fajr, maghrib, at least fajr, or, you know, start of your day, but it's preferred to do it twice a day, to get in the habit of saying awrad on your children at night before they sleep. You know, we tuck our little ones in again, but you know, teenagers, we don't think to tuck them in. Okay, fine, it might be awkward to tuck in a teenager, but if your intention isn't necessarily to read nursery rhymes for them, but to just stand at their doorway and or close to their bed and just to do protective da'as, these are measures that as parents, 
we're following, you know, the guidance of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, who didn't put a timeline on this stuff. It's just read God for yourself. I mean, he did it on himself. He read the you know, and he blew into his hands, and this was every single night. So for our most precious prized possessions, our beloved children, we don't think to do this, and then we wonder when we send them into this world where all the brothers evil coming at them from every single direction imaginable, literally even, you know, above them, hovering them, there's things uh, going on, that we don't think that we, you know, that it's okay to do that, or we just expect them to do it on their own. These are things that we have to, you know, again, create these cultures in our families. Um, subhanAllah. So, I have more, but I'm just going to now uh, talk about just a, a few things about social, we're going to bring it back to social media, because I don't want you to leave this conversation thinking it's all bad. Nothing is all bad, right? There's a lot of good that social media has as well, and it's important to highlight that because what I, you know, what I don't want is there to be this overreaction to some of the pre things presented here, and people kind of get a little maybe uh, paranoid and afraid. You know, there's a balance that we're trying to seek here, and uh, the responsibility, like I have been saying, really falls on our shoulders. But um, you know, some of the benefits, and I'll just list a few here is that through the internet, through social media, kids, teenagers in particular, can become more informed about current affairs and the world around them. Uh, with social media, teens can easily find about what's going on in their neighborhood, uh, school, state, country, um, you know, and it's, it's an important way to equip themselves with, with adequate knowledge of current affairs. So, I mean, I know, you know, there's a lot, especially Facebook, a lot of people, I don't know the exact statistic, but more and more people now are getting their news from Facebook, right? How many people here get their news from Facebook, right? Who goes to, like, you know, CNN anymore? Or maybe you might go later in the evening, but usually first morning thing is, like, let's see what the world, what's happening in the world on Facebook. And that's sort of our window to what's going on. So this is another opportunity where, yes, social media can do the same for teens. It's easier to study and carry out research work, so it is a legitimate uh, way to for kids to, to get together. Like if you have a group project, sure, you know, if there's a way to connect using Google Plus or you know Hangouts or whatever, it's a it's a good thing. So we don't want to, you know, just paint it all with one with one negative brush. Look at the positives and allow your children to know that you are also have a balanced perspective of things and you're not a hypocrite. If you're on, you know, uh, social app, media apps, you can't you know, point the finger and say, no, it's bad. You have to teach them the good and the bad. Um, it can boost self-esteem. Social media provides a place where teens can freely express themselves. Sometimes in classroom settings or in settings with their peers, they might not feel comfortable um, talking openly, and this is perfectly normal. Uh, you know, so public speaking is, is the number one fear that most people have. Teenagers are definitely part of that. So to speak up always about things that are happening, important causes, or maybe things in the class, might be hard, but maybe on, uh, you know, another platform where their class is, has access to it, they kind of can find their voice and speak to things. These are benefits of, of social media. Um, this is something we don't think about, but it's actually pretty important given uh, the fact that you know there are numbers rising in, in, in some of these groups, but um, it can help teens, particularly those with disabilities, learning you know uh, uh, disabilities, but also physical disabilities, with staying socially connected to their peers. Because if everything's happening at the local bookstore or the coffee shop or somewhere physically and I can't be there, but I can join in, I can Skype into a conversation. I can, this is a great benefit of social media because I'm not, you know, the outcast that can't do anything. So it does, alhamdulillah, provide that outlet for our brothers and sisters who are not always able to attend these things physically. It can assist, obviously, in getting jobs and networking. So for college applications, for, um, you know, jobs, there's you know, so many opportunities on social media to connect with other people and to network. So this is another benefit. Um, it helps teens keep up to date with current technology. Um, Things are always changing, so again, this is one way where kids can always stay in the loop. And then, um, from the Islamic perspective, social media gives uh, many teens now, especially more than maybe ever before, access to scholars that they don't normally have, right? Um, does anyone know, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I don't have statistics, but currently, who, who do you think is probably the most popular sort of you know, uh, that e scholar um, in the American Muslim or Western Muslim world. 
right? MashaAllah, no matter you guys know it, no matter Ali Khan, MashaAllah, may Allah reward him. He has over a million followers, right? Most of his access, though, is online. So if you cut your kids off from everything, then you, you know, this is another problem is that this is a great, you know, scholar of our time, MashaAllah. He's done so much good for our community and, and especially for engaging the youth. So you have someone like him, many other, uh, you know, scholars and activists also who are connecting with youth, especially doing like youth sort of, um, you know, youth driven, I guess you could say, talks through Snapchat, through, um, you know, uh, different, um, what is the one, Periscope, right? There's all these different mediums now that, that scholars can uh, engage with kids. And, you know, it's not always easy, mashallah, here, may Allah bless this community because you have the youth coming in and engaging, but there are communities where youth really aren't very much involved, but this does give them that platform. Um, obviously, to stay connected with family and friends abroad, this is another really great way if you want to teach your kids how to use social media with with good intentions, then please be mindful of this one, and I'm also speaking to myself directly. I have relatives that are abroad, and you know, sometimes, you know, because of time differences or whatever, it's not always easy to connect, but we do have to be mindful of, get, of, of teaching our children the importance of connecting with family. And we're not, you know, it's not as easy maybe for, for some people to travel to see family, but what a great blessing that we can now Skype in real time or, you know, use uh, WhatsApp or whatever where you're not even paying international calls anymore. So last week, I think it was, I called uh, my uncle from my mom and I was just shocked because you know, I didn't know this, I guess it's a new feature on WhatsApp, but that, you know, he, he's in Afghanistan, and we were able to have a total live conversation with no phone cards, no, you know, charge, nothing. It was just a free conversation. I was like, wow, that's great. So these are wonderful things, but this is something you have to be mindful of. Like, okay, if I'm going to allow you to have WhatsApp or allow you to have these things, then you're also going to use it in a way that's meaningful in a way that preserves our traditions, in a way that's important and reflects our values as a family. So when I tell you to call Nani G or Daddy G or Uncle G or Auntie G or whoever G, uh, you know, whoever in, 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 in back home, that they don't, you know, turn away, oh, you know, but then they're quick to text their friends. This is not, this is not a balanced view. You have to say if you're going to use it for, for fun and for, you know, connecting with your friends, you're also going to use it to stay connected with family. So these are, again, ways that parents can inculcate a balance when it comes to social media and having a healthy uh, use of it. And then um, this, my, this is one of my favorite ones because I really think as parents, especially, inshallah, I have the intention of my kids that if they're, when they're at the appropriate age for them to use social media, that they're going to use it to kickstart campaigns and uh, you know do it for really important charitable causes, mashallah. Um, I know personally, I think uh, Brother Omar is here and Zora is here, but when I gave this talk at, uh, I just called you, <laughs> when I gave this talk at SRVIC, I actually mentioned them as well, but mashallah, their son Ilyas in uh, December, right, end of December, through Facebook and through social media was able to raise $12,000. This is a teenage boy, he, he's 16, 17, 18, 16, mashallah, 16-year-old boy, $12,000 through social media to go and to help the children of Syria. He didn't just raise the money, but he actually, mashallah, took his intention even further. And he, him and his mother and mashallah, a few other friends traveled to uh, Turkey and they helped the Syrian refugees. This, what a great way to use social media in a positive way. These are ideas that we as parents have to really, you know, in, first of all, I mean, appreciate, alhamdulillah, that it's happening, but also think, how can I do this in my family? How can I take these ideas that other people are doing, even if it's a small effort, but it does reach out to your own family, your own networks. If you can get them to use social media to do these things, this is using something like this that we've been talking about um, um, you know, in a really good light, instead of just assuming it's all bad and dark, which it's not. But um, uh, again, MashaAllah. I wanted to also just leave with one other thing, um, and then I'm going to turn it over. I'm sorry, I kind of went longer than I wanted to, but one thing that um, a resource, moving, this is just a takeaway for you. A resource for parents, um, especially if your kids are in public school, I really, really advise you to, to follow this resource. It's called carefulparents.com. On this website, it's 
wonderful mail. I don't know who put it together, but I love it because what it does is it puts together, and it's updated frequently, what the latest trends are throughout public schools or throughout, you know, whatever, social media, whatever's happening that teens and young impressionable kids are, you know, caught up in, the latest trends, the latest little things that they do. I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff that teens are doing that we as adults sometimes are so unaware of. But this website has their ear to the ground, they know what teens are doing, and then they provide the content for parents to know. For example, one thing that I learned when I went to the website, and I had no idea, there was a trend recently that you took pictures, you, you basically put your phone, it's so awkward, but you, teens were doing this, taking pictures um, of between your, put, you're putting the phone between your knees and then taking pictures of them. I didn't know it was a trend, but apparently it was something very popular and it was sweeping across you know, different po communities but kids, you know, this is what they do. They hear about something and it's like, oh, I'm gonna do that. Or, you know, one of their favorite celebrities does something and next thing you know, it's caught fire and everybody's doing it. So these are types of things that this website will kind of give you, again, information about, just so that you can be aware. Because, all the you know, there's things that have happened uh, to children because of falling, you know, prey to, not peer, peer pressure, but also just wanting to be a part of the group, you know, like, not necessarily that someone's forcing them, but kind of picking up on trends and wanting to be cool, that, that cool factor that everybody's seeking. And they, they do these things that compromise their safety, their reputations, but if we don't know about them ahead of time, then we might think, oh, it's innocent, it's no big deal. But again, this website will, will kind of keep you in the loop about that. So with that said, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Rania, inshallah, and uh, then we'll, I think, do a Q&A and, and talk uh, after that. Bismillah. Thank you so much, Mr. Hosai, for all this informative information. I hope many of you feel that you've gained quite a bit of knowledge listening to Sister Hosai speak, different apps and different social media platforms and outlets that perhaps you use but didn't know the extent of what they really had in them in terms of not just the good that you use them for, inshallah, but also the detriment and perhaps other things and other names that you're not actually familiar with. So my talk, inshallah, is going to just kind of, I'm gonna do a conclusion statement for the discussion sisters on the side have here, so we have time for your questions, inshallah. I'm going to recap on some percentages that you said earlier, and then share some thoughts in terms of the effect and the consequence this might have on our children going forward, inshallah. In my point of view, I really feel that social media is one of those things that isn't going to go away. As much as you maybe duck your head and say, I'm not going to have a Facebook account, I'm not going to download such and such app, I'm not interested in such things. It's To me, it's kind of like cars. Once they were created, they didn't go away. <laughs> they only kind of progressed and progressed and progressed and one day they'll be flying. You know, mashallah. The reality is, once it's created, it's there to stay. Which means that our children, just like they're going to learn to drive, are going to use social media regardless. And as time goes on, our children and great-grandchildren and so on are going to have to acclimate, and we ourselves are going to have to acclimate to this. And I say this because the majority of people in this room, social media was not a priority for you and something you grew up with. You just simply didn't grow up with it. In fact, many of you in this room, many of us in this room, did not grow up with even knowing how to type without looking. <laughs> True? Yes? People, they, I mean, they still offer classes in high school, in, in school, of how to type without looking for those of us who are in this room. True? True. <laughs> now what our children do is, and they don't even look, and, and you are kind of going like, you know, <laughs> trying to type something. So the reality is it's only going to go forward. So us not really paying attention to it or hoping that it's going to just go away isn't realistic enough. So then what do you do? Part of it is what Sister Osai was saying about kind of understanding, even if you don't use it, but knowing what's, what's, what's it all about and knowing details about it. The percentage that you said earlier, and I'm going to actually say that the newest study that's come out, on the age group of 7 to 18, and how
how many of you have children in this age group? I think just about everybody in this room, considering that we have youth programs around, and many of your children are in that age group. 7 to 18, doing homework. Doing a homework assignment that required them to go online. Yeah? Which again is the majority of people in this room. The percentage of children, 7 to 18, who saw pornography while doing homework, literally just searching for an innocent homework assignment. They typed in whatever it was. Dinosaurs. Whatever. Type in something. The percentage is 70%. That's your children. That's our children. The reason I say that is not this kind of shock and awe factor, but the reality of what's there. You know this too. As you're searching something, something totally innocent, you're looking for something, the sidebar does what? Pops up something that you have to go like this to, right? And try to cover. Now, you may have the adult, inshallah, instinct and strength to do that, but the child does what? What's that? Clicks. That one click leads to soft porn that very quickly leads to hard porn. And that's all there is to it. Done. That split second. So now that we're all kind of terrified, we're like, what do I do? What do I do? There's a couple of really common sense things to do, but sometimes we don't fully take into account. Yes, they may need to look something up online for their homework assignment, but there's also something in the setting that says, block out all pictures. That's a very simple thing to do, right? And then when you need the picture, you just turn on what it is. You can manage these settings for yourself online. How many of us have actually done that with our phones and our laptops and our computers and desktops, etc.? Right? These are kind of the simple things to do, inshallah, to think about. And the site that you're mentioning helps kind of give some of this feedback. And inshallah, we'll have a discussion about what some of you have done to give tips to each other on what to do. But the reason I say that is because a lot of people don't realize here is the internet and they say, well, that bad stuff that you're referring to, Dr. Rani and Sister Hosai, those bad things you're referring to, it's far off, it's not so much, it's not a big deal. 80%, here's the internet, let's just say, 80% of what's beyond here is pornography. And if you don't know that number, you should. And you may say, why would I need to even know that? It's important to know that what you access, your, your what, Gmail account, a couple of websites, you kind of get some things off of Amazon, and maybe you check this and that, a couple of sites online, and that's really all you do online. But the reality of what's beyond that, what's beyond it over here, 80% of the internet is pornography. So that's important to say that when something clicks and clicks and clicks, it goes, it's very quick that it leads to something, not just haram, not just one of those things like when you're watching a movie and you go, right? But rather, so intensely haram and so intensely problematic that it can scar your mind for life. And I and imagine children. And then we worry about the addictive, and I'm gonna speak about addiction in just a minute here. Because addiction is not just drugs, right? Addiction is anything and everything you can get addicted to and your mind kind of has the pleasure that comes from it and then it, because it's pleasurable, it keeps on happening and it just goes up and up and up and up just like drugs would, right? It ramps up and you kind of get stuck and you don't know how to get out of that cycle. So when we say 80% of the internet is pornography and over 70% of our children just doing a basic homework assignment have seen pornography, then what? Then we really have the then what? And here's where I remember one of my spiritual teachers saying, and at the point, at this point in time, in that era that that teacher was speaking, it wasn't about social media, it was rather about just movies, right? Watching kind of a movie, an innocent family movie, and it could be literally the one haram scene in that movie, the one scene, right? If you're not, you didn't realize it was coming, it just sort of came and you saw it, is the one scene that after you leave that movie, your mind keeps playing over and over, right? Yes? Or no, you just keep saying that haram thing even if you don't mean to over and over again. And that is the shaitan, right? That's what shaitan likes to do, right? Keep on increasing in the haram. So imagine then the detriment of children seeing things that are way beyond anything they should ever, should ever see, right? So the spiritual imprint that these things have on our children I think is incredibly intense. And we know that, that for adults, let alone children, even for matters of you know, intimacy and so on, seeing these kind of things completely warp your sense of an understanding of what intimacy is all about and what it means. Which is why, for example, we need to have things like counseling centers because the majority of people that seek out this kind of help and care have issues 
all different kinds of issues, but within the domain of intimacy, often there's something there that has to do with the haram being viewed and the misunderstanding or the warped understanding of intimacy between husband and wife. So here we are back, so we'll go from the adult discussion back to children where we've been discussing and having this, um, the, the real results of what happens when children get addicted, right? So, and I say this, and we kind of all laugh about it a little bit, but you know, I've been noticing the last hour and a half we've had this lecture, the majority of you have, uh, have looked at your phone at some point or another. Yeah. <laughs> Just scanning the room, the majority of you have picked up your phone and did something or looked at something. It's only been an hour and a half. Your intention for coming tonight is a good intention. I'm going to listen to Adab or Halakha. I'm going to listen to knowledge. I'm going to benefit, inshallah ta'ala. Yet you couldn't get rid of your phone. <laughs> right? I'm not saying this to chastise or shame, right? My phone is sitting right next to me too. However, the issue is, I'm just pointing out how addicted we are to this thing. Truly, truly. So when Hosai asked the question, or said the question earlier, how many hours do you think children are accessing social media? If they are awake of roughly 16 hours of the day, and she gave the answer that 11 point something percent of hours, 11 and a half hours a day, right? 76 percent, 11 and a half hours of the day your children access social media. How many of you said, not my child? Come on, yeah. Yeah, many of you are thinking in your mind, not my child. Let me tell you something. In this, 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 the group that's over here, the, the, the young girls that are here, that Rahma does halakas for, so I've talked with them. And then I've done this talk and I've asked these questions all across the nation. I kind of go out and do different talks in different places around the country, Muslim communities. Just recently, just last week I was in Ohio doing this talk and in other places throughout the country. And I had this talk on social media and, and, and youth and fashion and body image and all kinds of other things. I usually talk to the girls about this. But, um, but it's interesting because the question I always pause to them, I say, close your eyes. I have them all close their eyes. And say, put up your fingers of how many hours a day you are on social media. Muslim kids, your kids, yes? At first, they just kind of like shyly put like a couple of fingers up, and then I say, look, I mean everything. I mean whether you're typing something for your work, for your homework, whether you are looking at apps on the phone, whether you're watching something, YouTube, etc. Just think of everything and anything called social media. And keep your eyes closed, because I don't want them to influence each other. Peer pressure is very common in this age group, right? So just that they think on their own how many hours a day. The couple of fingers that go up, after I ask the second question, this is what I end up getting. With their eyes closed, I get almost always. That they are averaging something like 15 hours out of their 16 hours a day awake. Many of your own children. The reason I say that is that it's clear in our minds how real this is. This is not like, oh, oops. One time they saw something haram. No, the likelihood this is going to happen on a daily basis is very high. So this, even the recommendation of why do they even take this at home, uh, I mean, in their room at night with them, right? But the reality is even through the day, even if you are very strict about the number of hours they're able to watch and what's on here, and Sister earlier mentioned how much data you allow them and you check on them and all the rest of it, the reality is just like adults, they're attached to this thing once you give it to them. Once you've made the decision to give them access, they're attached. Now, I'm going to talk about the detrimental um, impacts of that atta uh, attachment, as we know from the field of mental health. Just what are, what, are, what, are the, what are we seeing as professionals of children coming through? And honestly, a lot of this isn't just children, it's also adults. So think about it for yourselves, but also think about it in terms of in relation to children. So this idea of um, what we're finding often is an increase in loneliness and depression. The reason for it is so many people have built around them a virtual reality, a virtual world and virtual friends, almost like a bubble, a safe haven that they go to and they have these virtual friends that they've never met in real life. 
And the thieves, when you ask them, who are your friends? These are their nearest and dearest friends because they tell everything to and they send pictures to and they talk to and they have, they feel they have very meaningful relationships with these virtual people. And we talked about the story you gave about the very scary person who was acting like they were a child, but they were actually a, a child predator, right? But, but the increase of loneliness and depression in the advent of social media amongst youth has skyrocketed. So there's definitely a correlation between the two things. That our youth have become more lonely and depressed with this access to social media, as studies have shown. Also that it fuels anxiety. There are, there's a study, a very interesting study that says, that and this is about adults, but it says that adults who have their phones out next to them in work, so there you are in your desk, your cubicle, your workplace, etc., and you have your phone out next to you, you have more likely to develop anxiety than someone who puts their phone away when they go to work. <laughs> the reason being that you are, what, what's it doing? It's pinging, it's, it's, it's uh, beeping, it's vibrating, things are happening, you keep on checking, you keep on checking, <laughs> right? This anxiety that comes with it, it actually, there's a correlation between people that have their phone out at work or have their phone constantly next to them or with them all the time and the levels of anxiety that are increasing in our society in general. And Muslims are not immune to this at all. So the heavier the phone user, the heavier experience, uh, anxiety experienced. Increase of stress. So even our children are feeling more stressed out. And a lot of it has to do with the, the regular peer pressure that happens with tweens and teens. Like think about middle school and high school, the regular peer pressure of in-person. Now amplify that by all these virtual <laughs> friends and people that they have and all the extra pressure that comes from that. So even more peer pressure, even more stress, essentially, that's coming with being, uh, having these access, having this access. Um, attention deficit disorder. People always ask this question. Is there a correlation between ADHD and, and heavy social media usage? Now, while the medical field has not established a definite uh, causation, they have definitely at least over 50 studies have shown a correlation between social, but causation means one plus one equals two, where correlation is they're, they're parallel, they're correlated to each other. Over 50 studies have shown that ADHD, that heavy in, in uh, social media usage in young people has led to, has correlated with ADHD. And think about it, it makes sense, right? The hyperactivity, the um, irritability, the, uh, the, the hyper focused on things you're interested in, because you could say, well, my kid, when they play video games or they're playing one of these uh, games on here or whatever, they're so hyper focused. That's actually a symptom of ADHD because they're so hyper focused on something they like, but you ask them to go like put their socks on and it takes them like 50 minutes to do that, 45 minutes, right, of like wandering through and you telling them repetitively until they finally actually get their socks on. Now some of that is maybe they're a little bit rebellious, but part of it is their lack of being able to concentrate properly. So they're what's happening, you have a constant stream of messages and a constant stream of information coming at you, right? Your Facebook page that keeps on, it's just never ending, right? So what happens, you're just, you have, your, your brain is essentially overwhelmed and it's not able to concentrate properly. This is both adults and in children the correlation between the two things. So, you know, um, really we have to think about what this means um, in general. What else? The ability to, to diminished concentration and creative thinking. Because if you are plugged in all the time, your thoughts are essentially what everybody else is thinking and what everybody else is talking about. So think about youth here, think about young people, right? Whatever celebrity, whatever thing is happening, and they're like, 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 right? And not really taking time to think for themselves. Very, uh, very few, very, like, it's very, um, not often anymore, that people have the time to just sit still and have deep thinking. Yet in our dean, in our tradition, we put a lot of emphasis on the idea of the kid, on the idea and the sisters who've been in the sisters' halak every Friday know, right, our steps of improving yourself, the seven steps of uh, being a highly effective Muslima, right? One of those seven steps is what? Khalwa, right? The idea of being in a sacred space with no distraction and doing and, and connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and having, and we talk about the woman's khalwa, right? The woman's a'tikaf. 
right? We often, it's usually referred to as the men, and I won't go into labor that point because men do their atikaf here. But according to the Hanafi Madhab, the woman can do their atikaf at home, which is a beautiful thing. And the idea of having this sacred space where you sit and do deep thinking and reflecting. And we talk about retreat, reflect, and remember him often. For those of you in the Halakha, you are familiar with this terminology, right? The retreating, the reflecting, and the remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often, you can't do, and so I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the halakha, but this can't go into with you into Atikaf, sisters. <laughs> you need to leave this out of your Atikaf space. You, you, know, you know that line where you stand before and you make your attention and say, no way to Atikaf, wa hada masjidi, right before you walk in. This, this over here can't go into your masjid. <laughs> you need to take that out. <laughs> you, read, you know what? People talk about, and you know, subhanAllah, and in halakha, because you'll see me like reading my, my Quran, our daily Quran that we do on this. But you know what? I have to say, people have gotten so used to reading Quran on here that they've forgotten how to hold the actual mushaf. There is something very, um, very blessed about holding the actual mushaf and the pages of the mushaf. Do you know what I mean? And I really recommend that in your khalwa space you have an actual mushaf with you, inshallah. But back to what we were saying, this idea where you um, sitting still and thinking deeply about matters, reflecting deeply on the blessings Allah have give, has given you, who He is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you have in your life and what you need, um, and, and the, the role of people in your life, all these things we've discussed in Halakha, right? People have lost the ability to sit still. And as a result, in the last couple of hours we've been together, many of you have taking out your phones, right? We've lost the ability to sit still. Now imagine our children who don't even have, and remember, we grew up in, a, in, in an era when this didn't exist. So we've learned how to do some of this. At least we've had a taste of some of this, right? Even if we've changed now. But our children have never had this. They've only seen, they, they, they were born into this, right? So now what? How do we teach them creative and deep thinking? Unless you unplug in our summer camps, and actually, eat, we, we, you know what we actually do? If the girls come in with their um, phones and things, we go around with a basket and we collect all the phones. We give it back to them in the end, and if their parents are texting or calling, we say call Sister Amina, the camp coordinator, right? Because we want the girls to be completely media free to really think about and engage fully in what they're doing. But we literally have to collect these things from them, subhanAllah. And I think the same needs to happen at home, because really, um, you know, if you are constantly connected, it's it's there's not going to be that deep thinking. Then there's also the issue of lack, uh, detriment in sleep. So many of you as adults have this happening too, but your children are experiencing this too. The constantly being stimulated, right? The eye and the mind constantly being stimulated, literally is affecting our the sleep of our children and ourselves as adults too. Excessive smartphone usage and laptop usage can actually affect your sleep. So, um, you know, just, and when you don't have good sleep, it affects your overall mental health and well-being. So think about these things too as well. Then the part here, one of, this last, one of these last points that I really want to make is, you know, self-absorption. We joke about the selfie generation, right? That they're always like taking selfies of themselves and we say it's a selfie generation. But you know what? I really truly worry about the spiritual state of our children because the studies have started to show that this generation not only do they lack in social skills because they don't know how to interact with other people they're interacting with others through the phone I mean literally you walk into a room and every single person every single one of them has their head like this and sometimes they're actually talking to each other but through the phone <laughs> honestly go to restaurants and look at families Every single one of them is on a thing. Even though they're supposed to be eating dinner together at a restaurant, they're all looking <laughs> And sometimes talking to each other through here without actually talking directly. So not only the social skills, but this self-absorption, narcissism, right, that comes self-absorbed completely. The other, when I was traveling the other week, we were somewhere, and um, I sat somewhere for a while just waiting for some people. and. Uh, I was sitting in front of a place where people come, like it's a you know a special landmark place where people take pictures. And it was a lot of young people that were coming through and taking their selfies, right? But I sat there for over an hour, just doing my own thing, but I kept looking at every single group of people, that, and these are people I didn't see each other, they were just a group of youths who would come in, teens would come in, take some pictures of themselves, 
and go. And the next group will come in and do the same thing. But, but you know what's so interesting to me? That every single group of youth that came in, not only did they do a selfie, but they all did the duck face. Every single one of them. And I thought, subhanAllah, it's like they literally don't know how to take a picture of themselves unless they do that awful duck face. You know what I'm talking about, the duck face? Yeah, yeah. The, the lips. Um, and I was like, and they didn't even communicate to each other or talk to each other. They don't even know each other, right? They, they didn't even see each other. But every group would come in. And I said, subhanAllah, so self-absorbed that they don't even know how to, they're all stuck in, it's like they're all robots stuck in the same routine. SubhanAllah. And then stopping endlessly and posting endlessly pictures. One of the questions I ask our youth when I do my talk with them is how many of you, close your eyes and tell me, raise your hand, how many of you have altered your picture on social media to look different than you actually look? Whether it's through a filter or you added something to it or changed some blemishes or changed your eye color or whatever, right? Did something to alter every single kid's hand, almost every single hand goes up altering pictures of themselves, to do whatever in their mind, which is kind of a little bit skewed sometimes when I talk about body image, right, of what is beautiful. And so all of this is really affecting our kids, um, uh, you know, this unhealthy self-centeredness and really distancing themselves from real life relationships. So I think all of this we have to kind of really reflect on the effect of it. But again, like we said at the very beginning, it's not like it's going away. It's not like the point of today is that you go home and tell your kids, okay, give me your phone, give me your laptop, give me your phone, <laughs> I'm going to throw them away. That's not the point. Because the reality is that's not, that's not realistic, and it's not going to really actually help anything. But what is going to help is that once it's here, to know how to manage it. Just like once cars were created, you learn how to drive safely. right? It's the same idea here, learning how to drive this situation safely, inshallah. And so, you know, I just want to... Um, forewarn you of some of these things, and especially the literature and the research that's out there. And for some of you, maybe you have listened to this talk, and you said to yourself, okay, inshallah, I need to take some of these pointers away, go home and really work on some of this with my kids. Some of you might have heard this talk and realized, wow, maybe myself or my kid has, it's a little excessive, maybe it's a little much, maybe I actually need some help, maybe they actually have a true addiction. Now, this addiction, internet addiction, is a real thing. I want you to know that in psychiatry books, right, in terms of diagnosis, they have such things called gaming addiction, right, where people are addicted to internet, to, uh, excuse me, to video games. This is a real addiction, right? There is now internet addiction. There is such a thing as pornography addiction. These things are real addictions, right? And if you're finding yourself or your children are stuck in this mode or they need some extra help and counseling, well, right across the table here is our, is our Khalil Center table, right? We have counselors who are able to help with things like addictions and really all things related to our mental well-being and our family's well-being. So I do actually encourage you to seek out those services and I will put that plug in for the Khalil Center because I help you know, direct the, the, the center, but also because I really feel our community um, needs to come to a point in understanding that this is not going to go away and this is and if it's there it's not something you stick your head in the sand and ignore but rather you seek help for inshallah ta'ala and for those who don't feel that this is actually their case or come to know they're not at that point right then to take the preventative measures from getting to that point so maybe whether it's like parenting counseling or uh, help on parenting or how to deal with children especially as they get into the tweens and teens age that's also something that can you can seek, inshallah, professional help for with our Muslim uh, therapists, inshallah ta'ala. So I want to kind of emphasize the help is there. The resources, whether online, like the <laughs> website you mentioned, or whether in person with therapists, but I do actually really recommend that you seek that help. If you heard all everything tonight and you felt, wow, I, I think I need some extra assistance here, assistance is available, inshallah ta'ala. So I don't want you to leave kind of feeling, I don't know what to do and I'm not sure where to go, right? There is actually help for it. For this, I think our role tonight is really showing um, some of the detriments of where, when this is unchecked and things are just sort of handed to our young people, the detriments that can happen to that. And we're trying to elucidate that for you and make it very clear, inshallah ta'ala. So with that, I wanted to take some time for our Q&A section. And we're going to have, I think, both written and also uh, questions that are asked um, that you can just ask directly because we want to have a discussion about this topic 
But before we do that, I'm just going to say one more thing very quickly, inshallah. And again, putting in that plug uh, for the Khalil Center, I do want to make you aware that on next Sunday, the 30th, is the banquet, which I hope all of you will come, inshallah, because it's in Dublin. Um, and the, the sisters that are in the back right, you can purchase their tickets directly from them, inshallah ta'ala. So please do support an institution that is helping address some of the needs of our community, inshallah ta'ala. And with that, we'll take some questions, inshallah. <coughs> I just want to add one more thought to this idea um, that we didn't say earlier. Like we said, this isn't going to go away anytime soon, but I think what's really important is that even in the age of social media, that you still have a connection with your children, this very deep connection and transparency. You spoke about being friends, like not, um, not letting being friends with your children come at a cost of then not knowing what it is that they're up to. Right, because you're trying to be hip and cool and all the rest of it. While we do encourage that and really being friends with your children, especially like the hadith talks or the saying of Ali says to, in the later years, but at the same time, to really have that deep, you should never come at a cost of having that deep connection with them to continue. And I want to say the thing about the suicide, seeing, seeing, um, seeing like murders online, right? And the harm of seeing pornography online. But the, and there's also a third harm. I don't think we mentioned it so far in our talk right now, but one of the things that really worry me like intensely, and I think those of you have heard me speak before, that I'd say that the ill, the, the ill of our current era and time is atheism. 
right? I always talk about how the, like our youth are truly, truly grappling with this idea of leaving Islam and leaving the idea that there is a God and really completely moving themselves away from that. A lot of these thoughts are coming through social media. A lot of these thoughts are coming through forums online. A lot of these ideas, dark ideas, and, and concepts are coming through stuff that they're accessing online. So think about that too as they're kind of alone. What, what is it they're reading? Just like we would say when people were using books, and we would say for parents, read through your child's book, right? That's in the time where like all you were really screening for was bad words and people kissing, right? But now you're screening for really like deep, deep, um, dark, dark ideas, including the idea of rooting out their faith. So for children and youth that we've talked with, that we dealt with actually, that have talked, that are really thinking through and believe they're no longer Muslim and they're atheist and they're very scared to tell their parents these things, but are willing to talk to a counselor maybe, and that's how we know of these things, or through the youth groups. It's amazing when you ask them, where did you get these ideas or how do you even know about them? A lot of times it's stuff Again, the world is at their fingertips, and all kinds of ideas are at their fingertips. And we didn't even talk about gender identity kind of issues and so on. Also, a lot of this is, so you say, where did this come from? This is where a lot of it is coming from, right? And if it's coming from their friend, well, their friend, their young friend, who's only old, as old as them, right? Likely got it from social media, too. So think about this, too, and, and feel and very much engage your children in conversation. And if you're having trouble of how to engage children, you know, we're more than happy to discuss this because I think that's going to be a key component in solving some of these issues, inshallah ta'ala. Um, Jazakallah khairan, Brother Adi, also, mashallah, you had some amazing insight, and I'm so glad you shared actual experiences, because, again, stories like that are so powerful, and sh I'm sure many people, you know, may have never even known what this thing called the dark web or the dark net is. Has, it, has anybody heard of this term before? Do you know what it is? So, Dr. Adi mentioned that 80% of what's out there online is pornography. That means 20% is relatively safe. This is the internet that we access. There is a, an entire other internet that's literally called the dark world. It's a demonic place. This is where predators exchange child pornography, where you can witness live murders, where you can witness live rapes. The extent of what people do, it's clear that we are living in really uh, just very, very dark times because some of the things you can't even fathom that people are capable of doing, but you'll hear stories coming out of this particular um, part of the internet that we luckily, the majority, the vast majority of people don't have access to, but it is easy to get access to it if you just know someone who knows these backdoor channels through the internet. It's just a matter of some coding, some, you know, certain, I, I'm not sure if it's HTML or what language, but there is a way to get into this. And teens, unfortunately, are getting access to these things, and uh, God forbid that any kids uh, younger are, but I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. But these are term, terms that we should, again, be uh, aware of. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that, SubhanAllah. I actually had it written because I was going to talk about the dark net. So you uh, brought that up, and I, I really appreciate that. But in addition to that, um, you know, I just wanted to, I was going to say something, SubhanAllah, following your point. Now I, I forgot it. But I did want to mention something else about YouTube. YouTube is something that most of us use, and we think, oh, you know, it's, um, it's innocent, it's fine. But this is now, I think there was something recently uh, that came out where all of there are some people who are just very, very evil. They are targeting children. And what they do is they create seemingly innocent videos that are all cartoony and you think like, oh, it's fun. But then halfway through it, something really evil happens or just, you know, it's just, it, it's not at all innocent at all. They're, they're you know, there have been reports of these popping up more and more frequently on YouTube. So don't think, oh, you know, they're just watching a simple cartoon and, you know, it's okay. I've, I've, I've filtered the first couple of minutes. Think about, like, really taking it to the next step, watching everything before you give them access. Um, you know, that's just one thing. But in addition to what, what has been said about conversations and being open, I think it's very important that we as um, parents, as educators, as adults, just remember that these things have to be established early on. If you're catching up and trying to have these conversations um, with your teenagers when you don't know anything about them in the first place, they're gonna tell you everything you wanna hear. They'll tell you, no, 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 I don't do anything. You know, they'll act 
exactly as they should because they don't want to ruffle, you know, they don't want to get you upset, they don't want to, um, you know, basically expose what they're doing because there's no connection in the first place. They just don't feel that you're interested in them. So we have to really start, you know, younger and make sure that our you know, this connection that Dr. Neal was referring to is established early in the year so that we are their best friend. We're their first, you know, line. If they're curious about something, they feel comfortable talking about certain things with us. For example, the birds and the bees. I know in our cultures, many of our cultures, we were raised with, um, you know, where these topics were never discussed. My parents never ever, ever, ever had this conversation with me about the birds and the bees. It, it's just not something that they did because in their cultures, it's not what, you know, what they, what happens. You just kind of learn whatever on your own. But that's not, we can't parent the same way. We can't be awkward about it. And I think this is a big problem in a lot of our cultures that we get awkward about having conversations that are uncomfortable. We get awkward about having conversations about pornography or sex, sex in general, sexuality, gender differences. All these things make people clam up because our cultures are so conservative and we just think, uh, you know, forget it. They'll learn about it one day and I don't want to have that conversation with them. And this is not going to work because if you're not the one having conversations with your teenagers especially, then someone else is going to have those conversations with them. And that's when they get exposed to all the things you don't want them to learn. And you know, I'll give you an example. When I was in high school, because I didn't know anything, this is a personal story. I was a ninth grade high school girl. I didn't know anything about this topic of sex or sexuality because it just wasn't something we learned. And I remember befriending a girl, she was a very popular girl, um, cheerleader. She um, was very pretty, so she actually became the girlfriend of the senior football captain. Okay, so he was a senior, she was a, a, a freshman. And I remember we had class together one day and she was just bawling, she was crying. And I asked her if she was okay. And then she uh, proceeded to you know, just tell me what happened. And she said that moments before, he took her to the parking lot and basically they had, he, he made her perform a sexual act on him. I remember feeling honestly like just shocked. Like I was stunned because I didn't know what it was first of all and to learn it in that way, I hated the fact that, you know, now when I think back on it, I was traumatized. I was like, I didn't even know people did that. And then I'm here trying to be a good friend to this poor girl who's crying. She was basically, I mean, she was, you know, she did it, but she wasn't happy because it was her first time to experience. But I was exposed to this whole world of sexuality in a very traumatic way, and I, I wished, you know, I mean, I don't blame my parents, but I know that for my children and our, the generations to come, we can't do that to them. I, I don't think any of our children should ever learn these things in, in a, such a horrible way. We should have discussions at age-appropriate levels. Um, you know, when is the right time. So that's just an, an asiha that I have for any parents of teenagers who may come from similar conservative backgrounds to not, you know, shy away from these conversations because it makes you uncomfortable. That's not, that's not putting their best interests in mind. It's basically putting your best interests. It makes you uncomfortable. You don't want to do it. But what about what they need? As parents, again, it's our job to safeguard them. So put aside those issues and if you can't do it that's when you reach out to a men mental health you know professional mashallah someone who is totally capable of having these conversations with you or, or guide you on that and, and helping you that but just thinking like I'm gonna sweep it under the rug and hope it just works itself out is negligent parenting and I'm just being really frank there and we can't do that to our teenagers so I mean that's just you know one you know small part of, of what we all can do in addition to what we've uh, already advised in terms of just being aware, uh, educated, these are all things that we can do, but this is another thing as well, is really being open to having these discussions in the first place. So I'm sorry I just kind of went off, but is there are there any other questions? Because I think we took one from the brothers, from the sisters. I'd like to say something. Um, if you want to look at things like the something, just take their phone after you the day and, for a few, uh, and just say, give me a phone. And if they start crying, throwing a tantrum, they need help. They're addicted, so get some help from telling something. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to add this is, you know, an incredibly difficult topic that I'm telling you guys about what you've done an amazing job of doing so well. Uh, two things. Is it possible for you to help summarize and perhaps create a guideline that can be shared and is, you know, published on each
into advertising videos now. Yes. And, you know, even the really young kids are now starting to watch them. Do you have any comments as to the impact of it and, you know, what sort of precaution we should be taking, if any, or are can we consider those models? That's a very good point you brought up, Jazakallah Khair, because the advertising is horrible. I mean, you could be watching a Sami Yusuf or Islamic, you know, song and thinking everything's fine, and all of a sudden, you know, a half-naked person comes on the screen and advertising something inappropriate. But it happens all the time. I have invested in, um, you know, I think it's, it's KidsTube or something. It's, it's YouTube for children. And this is one way that you could just completely, they've done a very good job of filtering out all those advertisements that are inappropriate. So if you wanted to, you know, use that, especially for small children. For teenagers, I don't honestly know if there is another alternative, um, I'm sure, because there are, mashallah, people of other faith-based communities that are just as concerned about these things as we are, and they have kind of come up with different ways um, to work around the dangers of the internet by, you know, uh, by either creating uh, websites that are alternatives to a lot of these things or by having, um, you know, places or websites dedicated to really helping parents navigate what's safe, what's not, you know, with movies, with television. So there might be an alternative um, to YouTube for like an older audience. I'm not sure. Does anybody, does anybody else know here other than the kids YouTube? Um, I think there's halal tube, right? For the Muslims, there is one. There's a halal tube. So, um, you know, I think it's just a matter, honestly, of of um, being vigilant. And I'm not actually sure if the the parental controls that we place on our computers or our, our, on our internet can also uh, prevent ads from coming up. Maybe someone um, who uses like NetNanny or any of these other, um, you know, parental control or you know apps or devices. Maybe, does anyone have insight on whether or not you can also protect um, children from seeing ads or uh, other, you know, pop-ups sort of that come up? Anybody? No? Did you have? So oh. we'll make this the last question, inshallah. Sure. Right. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that either it was yesterday or the day before. Uh, it was either yesterday or the day before when a report came that uh, a news organization did a study on YouTube Kit and they've recommended not to use it. So just to just to correct you on, on, on that. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to add to the website which you mentioned earlier, uh, in relation to that there's another website by Jim Steyer who led the California's efforts to banning a violent video game. It's called Common Sense Media. Yes. Common Sense Media, or, or I think every parent yes. should have access to that because that really rates things not just on a superficial level, but they go, they really go down, deep down and then that. The third thing I want to mention is because I work in an industry which is closely related to media, is in terms of virtual reality that is coming through. So I know I've spoken to parents, and even earlier I used to think that yes, we can connect our, our iPads and our laptops on a bigger screen, and we know what's happening and what our kids are, sur uh, are surfing, but with virtual reality and virtual screen, there's no way for us to know. So those are some of the things I just wanted to mention that we should be watching for them, obviously consider whether we want to give them uh, access to those things. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, brother, about your, um, thank you for your, because Common Sense Media actually is one of the top, I agree, and I forgot it, but you reminded me to mention uh, that as well. But in, in terms of your first question about putting together a resource, yes, I can take our talk, and inshallah, if Dr. Rania sends me her content, and we can put something together to offer uh, Brother Munir and the community, and we'll add these resources to it, and also I'll, I'll do that, I'll take that as, as part of my task, to look for any alternative alternatives to some of these things because you know we like I said we don't want to completely disconnect but we want to find the best and safest routes to to connect our children and ourselves so inshallah um, I will do that and I'll be in touch with brother Mania for that Jazakumullah khair and thank you so much oh yes Assalamualaikum khair for the talk mashallah it's really really uh, important for me uh, as for me I have uh, three kids uh, my oldest one is still seven years old so he's not yet uh, get this kind of thing. But I wanna you know kind of maybe all of us here want to kind of head head uh, ahead to uh, you know what can we do as a things that we can do at home. Like I was thinking to maybe put a basket so that maybe every time we go inside the house just put the cell phone there so that you know the kids learn how to be disciplined about this thing from early on. Maybe from Dr. Rania or Dr. Sister Hasai there is any 
steps for us that we can practically do at home to benefit Sure. I can share because my kids are similar in age to yours. One of the th rules that we have, and my husband is here as well, is we're really uh, strict about the internet use for them. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, games, you know, they have apps, and that's pretty much all they do. They don't really do anything else. And these are apps that we've vetted and we've made sure are perfectly safe and they don't have any crazy ads or anything like that. But we have very clear rules that, you know, there are certain times, usually if we're on a long drive somewhere or we're traveling, those are you know the times that they get apps but in the home um, on rare occasion if they're sick you know so it's just a culture we've created that, that, that where they know that they don't even ask for it it's not something it's an option where you know I have to deal with whining over it because from a very very early age when they even understood what apps and, and techno, you know devices were they understood that in our household they only get it when at certain designated times. It's not, you know, um, if I think when you get really lax about that and it's sort of like, ah, oh, today, okay, tomorrow, no, then kids are smart, you know, they, they know how to work us. They're very good at working us and they, you know, just have to pout a little bit and, and do whatever to get us. But if, when you create really, really clear rules, then they know and alhamdulillah, like we've never had an issue because they just understand that we don't get apps, you know, um, or, you know, we don't get devices during the day at home. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so that's one thing. And then, you know, I, obviously setting limits as your kids get older. We've talked about, we talked about it um, at the previous talk at SRVIC, but absolutely having, uh, I am very much uh, in favor of, ha for older kids especially, devices always should be um, charged. And I think, mashallah, um, um, Brother Esmet and Sister Hinesh, I don't know if she's here, but they shared their, you know, sort of rules in their home. But basically, charging stations are outside of bedrooms. They're never, you know, you don't charge your, your, your phone or your device in your room. Computer use, whether it's laptop, iPad, or even a, a you know, desktop, has to be in plain view of the family. It can't be facing a wall. You don't, that's not uh, safe. You know, if you think about it, if the family is all gathered there and I'm here and I'm like, yeah, I'm working on my science project, right? It's so easy. Kids know how to swap screens really quickly so the moment you come over, it's like, oh yeah, it's, you know, math. Whereas maybe two seconds earlier they were chatting, you know, with their friends. So everything should be in plain sight. Make sure that the devices are, if you walk by them, you can see them. Um, and, um, I mean, these are just some things that I remember being uh, presented at the last talk, but also investing in some of these, um, you know, services that actually do help parents uh, monitor the usage. I think one of the sisters mentioned, mashallah, limiting data so that you have a set amount and you'll, that's it, they cap out after that. You don't, you know, you're not able to access it anymore, having cutoff times, nothing past this time. These are all little things that we can do as parents. Um, did you want to add anything? I'm just going to, I'm going to add one more thing. Um, and it's something I'm going to ask all of us to do, and myself included. So let's see if we can make a promise kind of to ourselves, I think, inshallah. And I, this goes with the parenting part, which is that when we come back home from school, the kids come from school, if you're working back from work, that we take, kind of take a, um, a promise, an oath, of putting these away. Literally, like putting them away. And for those of you who are constantly connected to work, and I know many of you have to like reconnect and re get, you know, log back on and kind of can finish work in the evening. But for those precious hours, kind of like the two or three hours that you really like, your kids are out at school all day and you're out at work all day, or maybe you, you're home, but your kids and your husband and so on have been out all day. And when finally everyone is back together in one place, that's where these things need to be put away far, far away. I mean, if you're downstairs, that's where dinner time is, these go upstairs or whatever. I mean, to the point that they're really far away and you can't access them. And as kind of an oath, a promise that you've taken, because if anything is going to actually help with connecting again with your children and having that channel again, these are a barrier. They're just in the way. And they're not going to actually let that happen. So if anything, it's actually quality time, which means that if they have phones, like you've given them to them, maybe they're older uh, kids of yours, that they also take an oath that this is a special sacred time with our family. Nobody's allowed to touch any of the media until that time is over. And maybe that will help, but I'm happy to hear kind of, eventually hear kind of your feedback and your experience, is this working or is it not? But I think, inshallah, we're going to find that there actually is a difference with our children, inshallah ta'ala.
Inshallah. Brother Manin has asked me to close out, inshallah, before our Aisha prayer. So I want to thank everybody again for coming. I hope this was informative. I ask you to um, please forgive our um, mistakes and any uh, mis anything that we haven't actually seen or maybe we've given some wrong information. Please forgive us. It's a work in progress, inshallah ta'ala. And if it's beneficial, we ask you to make dua. We'll just take a minute here and do dua together. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين يا رب يا كريم we ask يا كريم to accept from us this gathering يا رب العالمين open your doors of mercy يا كريم shower your mercy down upon us يا رب العالمين we ask you that this gathering that have come here tonight to listen يا ربي to these words that they're beneficial يا كريم يا ربي take this knowledge and make it something we're able to implement for your sake Ya Rabbi, we ask you that if there was knowledge herein that was not acceptable to you, that you forgive us, Ya Kareem, and replace it with what is better. Ya Rabbi, Ya Kareem, we ask you to keep our feet steadfast on the straight track until the last day. Ya Rabbi, make our children steadfast on the straight track until the last day. Ya Rabbi, don't let us fall off the track or let them fall off the straight track ever, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, anyone who has strayed or gone far away, we ask you to bring them back to the steam. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to be reasons why they come back to this deen. Ya Rabbi, any one of our youth or our children who are toying with the idea of atheism, we ask you, Ya Kareem, to take that idea away from them and solidify their iman. Ya Rabbi, we ask you, Ya Rabbi, Al that anybody who is dealing with any form of addiction, Ya Rabbi, that you help cure and treat that, Ya Rabbi, Al Ya Rabbi, we ask you that we be people that our insides match our outsides. Ya Rabbi, that our outsides match our insides. Ya Rabbi, that when you look inside of us, you are pleased. Ya Rabbi, the vile traits and characteristics we have, we ask you to purify them, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, put us in the company of the righteous always, Ya Rabbi Alameen, and our children, so that we may be on the straight track. Ya Rabbi, purify us in this dunya before the akhirah. Ya Rabbi, we ask you that on that last day when you ask us the questions you surely will ask us, that you are pleased with our answers. Ya Rabbi, Ya Kareem, we ask you to keep us close to you. Make us from the muqarrabin. Ya Rabbi, make us from those who you love and who love you. Ya Rabbi, increase our love of you and increase our love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And make our children and ourselves people who are connected to you and your home and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rabbi, Ya Kareem, we ask you for the highest levels of Jannah. With the Salihin and the Shuhada and the Anbiya and the Salihin, Ya Rabbi Alameen and the Prophet Muhammad. Ya Rabbi, Ya Kareem, we ask you that on that last day, Ya Rabbi, that you are pleased with us. That we are people who fly on the Sirat straight into Jannah. And we have nothing to do with the hellfire, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, Ya Ilahi, Ya Rabbi, we ask you, Ya Rabbi Alameen, for our children and for the sake of our children to strengthen us and to strengthen their Iman, Ya Rabbi Alameen, and to help us help them. Ya Rabbi, we raise our hands in remembrance of all the sisters and brothers in this Ummah. Ya Rabbi, let us be people who remember our sisters and brothers in the Ummah. Ya Kareem, for help them. Help all those who are suffering, who are oppressed, who are hungry, who are scared. Ya Rabbi, who are in war, who are in famine. We, in natural disasters, we ask you to give them back security and aman. Ya Rabbi, we ask you, you to return them back to their homes safely. We ask Ya Rabbi Alameen to, keep, to take that fear out of their hearts and strike down the oppressors, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, and let us be people who know and who help in whatever way they can help, Ya Kareem. Ya Rabbi, let us be people who help in whatever we can do. And always remember them in our du'as. Ya Rabbi Alameen. We ask you that the last of our deeds be the best of them. We ask Ya Rabbi Alami that the last of our words be La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And we ask you for Husn al Khitam. Husn al Khitam. Husn al Khitam. Wala hawla wala quwwata illa billah al Aliki al Azim. Wa sallallahu ala al Hadi Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa sallam ajma'in. Wa ala niyat al Qubul. Wa al-Hidayah wa al-Nasr. Wa salami fi kulli makan. As'aluka Ya Rabbi and sisters and brothers, read with me for acceptance of this dua, Surah al Fatiha. Amin, amin. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.